Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Uh, obviously, I'm not Bishop Cruz. If I were, this place would be packed. Um, <clears throat> but I am delighted to be here. I feel like a gunslinger. I've got you know, two packs here, and they're taping me and all of this. We're going to have some fun today. I'm going to try to get you out on time for lunch and talk about gracious giving. But lest anyone puts in the comments that I look too corporate, I want you to know that I'm channeling the best Bishop Groose I can in this black suit. Um, and I normally always wear a suit when I present, so bear with me. We're going to have some fun, and we're going to go through two sides of, of gracious giving. One is the best I can do on the message that Bishop would like to bring to you, and the other side would be my view of it as a layperson, uh, being in a small parish in Custer and doing a fair amount of travel when my wife and I are on the road. We go to various Catholic churches, etc. So hello to the people that know me and those of you that don't know that I'll probably take up all the time. Also, I need to apologize. I found out Thursday night that I was doing this presentation. And don't put this in the film, but I said to Bishop, why don't you send me your presentation? Because uh, he, he can't speak very well right now. Um, and he said, oh, it's all in my head. I said, oh, okay, well, so bear with me if you see any typos or whatnot, we will we'll get through this. Uh, but the topic is gracious giving, and I always like to start my presentations that, that we understand what the word philanthropy means, because it's a big word and not too many people use it, and they say, what's philanthropy management? Well, it's the love of mankind. It's much more than just fundraising or giving, and this presentation is much more than that. So if, you, if you're based in philanthropy, this will make sense. Anybody know who this is? This, this is an old enough crowd. Who, who said first? Mr. Peabody. This is not a trick-or-treat basket, it's a reward basket. Hold on to that, Brian, you're the guy. Take some and... All right, what, what, is, what are they at? Anybody know the name of that machine? Come on, you grew up on this, some of you. The Wayback Machine, okay. We're gonna take a step back here to 1987. I love doing this part of the presentation with millennials. We got any millennials here? They weren't born then. So you're gonna get all the answers to this, but the millennials have a very hard time. Who was our president in 1987? Give him a piece of candy, please. Ronald Reagan. This will be a little harder unless you were probably in high school or whatnot. What was the number one song in 1987? I was surprised when I looked at it. Anybody remember this? Walk like an Egyptian. She got it. <laughs> Walk like an Egyptian. I was really not pleased when I looked at the top 10 songs from 1987. Not too many of them are classics. But I guess this one is. 
This one is not a, not a trick question, but I looked back. What was cutting edge technology in 1987? The cell phone or the brick phone? Who was doing air traffic news in 1987? Bishop Groose. Bishop Groose. And who was on their way to Davenport, Iowa, which is where my life intersects with Bishop Gruse. In 1987 was when I started my career in philanthropy. There's a picture coming up, Don, but I'm only going to flash it very briefly. <laughs> I was a rookie. I had a new job. They made me a consultant and they told me, okay, you're 25 years old or thereabouts. They said, go get two suits and a pair of wingtips. And that was my uniform in philanthropy, so that's why you see me in a suit. That was me in a brochure because they didn't, need, they didn't have a priest that would pose in the brochure for the reason we were raising money at the Diocese of Davenport. So this one doesn't get out much and no, it won't be available for distribution. <laughs> but I will tell you, my mother was delighted when she saw this because I was still single and she thought maybe I was making the transition. But what was interesting was I started my career at the Diocese of Davenport and two years later, our bishop entered seminary and he is from Davenport. So there's a little bit of, uh, of humor, but when we think about the times, they change or do they? I was, I was at the, the back end of Father Mike's presentation, and I'm just gonna go through these, I'm not gonna read them to you. But you know what's unusual is a lot of things may have changed, but one thing really hasn't changed, and that is people, relationships, contacts, communication, was anyone here for Father Mike's presentation? I know I was here for the last few slides and he kept talking about talk to people, get in front of them, be with them. That's what today's all about. You're going to have to look within yourself but also look at the people you're with. It is still all about people. I could go on and on and on and I promise I won't about the philanthropy landscape in the United States, about social media and email and letters the only way to effectively raise philanthropic dollars still in the United States is one-to-one, -one, person to person. It's about stewardship and I realize we have different <laughs> lenses of stewardship here, but stewardship is about being a good steward yourself and helping to steward others. So what are we going to talk about in gracious giving? Well, it's going to become painfully evident to you what part of this is Bishop Cruz's. So you can't ask me any questions on the first part. But I do want to impart the message. I had him get out of his head some of his ideas so that he could, he could share those with you today. First off, I, I probably should let you know that I was an English major. So everything to me is very much defined in words. And so I always look back, what's a steward? Well, the definition is up there. There are various ways of being a steward. We know what a steward is in the Catholic faith. Stewardship, basically we're responsible for being good stewards of our life here on earth. And we believe as Catholics that we were given these gifts from God. And that's the baseline we start at. Oh, it's trivia time. You've got to break these up. All right, who wants a piece of candy? Brian, you're going to have to be the candy man, I hope. You can just pass it around, there's a lot for everybody. What country has the most Catholics in the world? South America. Country. country. It's a teacher in me, I was a teacher before I was a fundraiser. Just throw out... US. US, nope. Nope, I was surprised too. Mexico. Nope, keep going. Brazil. Brazil has the most Catholics. Anybody want to guess how many? Brazil? 151 million Catholics in Brazil. That's how many are in the U.S. All right, let's talk about generous giving and lively faith. The, this is the section for Bishop Gruss, and it's difficult for me to present, look at my laptop, and look up here. So I'm going to do some talking, and I'll ask you to just kind of look through his messaging here. The, the, bold, the emboldened words are really the, the core of a bishop's message. But we're moving deliberately 
from hospitality to faith to discipleship. We may already be disciples in our own minds, we may be moving toward that, but when we are there, the gracious giving becomes part and parcel of, our, of ourselves and our soul. In the disciples' response, these three elements are presented to us. And basically, we're given God's gifts, we should be good stewards of those, and grateful for all that we have. If you've been to any of Bishop Gruce's presentations here at the summit or anywhere else, he, he will say kind of off the cuff, it's not your money, it's God's money. And, and he truly believes that, and, and I believe it too. It is all a gift given to us. And we're all generous in our own way. This is not a baseline of going from lack of generosity to generosity. It's simply looking at gracious giving and trying to figure out how we can be better stewards of what we have, of our hospitality, of our faith, and our discipleship. That's another, another comment. Uh, returning the gifts with increase to the Lord is a theme that our bishop talks about often. He talks about these items also. An act of faith, an act of trust, an act of worship, and an act of belonging. I'm sorry that I have to move around, but I can't really see what I'm talking about here as well. A disciple says, I don't own anything, and I will follow Christ in his grace. That's true. I think, I feel a little bit like I might be preaching to the choir here. You're all here for the summit. You're putting, you're taking time from your families and from your weekend to be here. But remember, if you can take little kernels away today and take them back to your parishes and to your family, you will increase your stewardship. Well, you have to have a plan no matter what you do even if it's getting the presentation at the end of Thursday and putting it together. Uh, Bishop would say, and has said to me, stewardship is plan giving. Well, in my work, plan giving is sitting down and figuring out your estate and your will and those kind of things. But what I think Bishop means is that you actually sit down with yourself, your family, and reflect and have a plan. I've been in this business for 30 years. My wife and I don't have a plan for stewardship. Take that off the tape too. I'm just, it's true though. I mean, to really sit down and look at it, how many, you don't have to raise your hand on this, but how many of you have a plan where you've actually sat down, looked at your charitable giving, looked at your giving to the church. Some people are nodding, yes. Great. That's you can be helpful to some of the rest of us, but sitting down and having the quiet moments to take the time and look at what you're doing. Like I said, we're all generous, but actually committing to a plan is, is important. Bishop always tells us it's not about volunteerism, it's not about the money. You don't volunteer in your parish, you become part of your parish. And again, you know, I. I need to go to reconciliation as much as anybody because I think I said no to someone in our parish three times to help them out with fundraising. And you know it was easier to say no than yes, but I should have said yes. I really should have become more committed. There are three spirits of stewardship. If you were here for Father Darren Gurr at Pastoral Ministry Days, he talked about these, and Bishop wanted me to mention these to you. A spirit of gratitude, a spirit of generosity, and a spirit of trust. We're going to briefly touch on those. Teresa, will you let me know when it's about 20 after? Oh, Lord. Okay, I've got a lot to do, so I'm going to get moving. Spirit of gratitude. My heart will be resting in the Lord. Again, this is from Father Derringer. Gratitude allows us to see the good things and the blessings in ourselves. We desire less and are willing to give more away. We are willing to sacrifice for the sake of others. I cannot speak to the second bullet here as well as one of our clergy can, but you can ask them to connect the Eucharist to giving, to stewardship, etc. The spirit of generosity. 
This is an important point, the roadblock of fear. We tend to be fearful of giving back because we don't know the future. Fear of running out, what's going to happen. There are story after story after story of people that step outside their comfort zone and make a charitable gift and it really is returned many fold. I won't say ten, could be five, could be two, could be a wonderful story, but I bet in this room, if we had enough time, many of you could share a story about how you stepped out and made a gift of time or of money and how it came back to you in greater measure. That's really what this is about. Bishop would say fear and faith are incompatible He's hard to argue with when he, when he does this kind of presentation. Spirit of generosity. We live in gratitude and generosity, trusting that God will always provide. I understand from a lay person's perspective, we have bills to pay and we have families to support and we have children to support and some of us have parents to support, etc. That's where the plan comes in. You've got to plan all of it. You can't, you can't walk out of here and pledge 100% of your income to your parish, you have to be responsible. But if you sit down and make a plan, I think you'd be surprised. The spirit of trust. It's easy to live in the past and say, this, this is the way it was, and I'm worried about what's going to happen. 2008 came, I lost my job, etc. But trusting in God and living in the present can help us along with our plan. Okay, next trivia question. Who was the last apostle to die? This, you only have how many choices here? John. John. Okay. When? Uh, <laughs> yeah. I guess he lived quite a while. Okay, this is my perspective, which is going to be less on the faith side and more on, I guess, what you'd call the person in the pew. And so I'm going to give you a couple of action steps, etc. I think there's at least one more trivia question to make it interesting. Teresa, let me know when it's 35 after. There's no, you know, this is, this is a chapel. There's no clock down there, so I can't keep an eye on where I am. Uh, when we make a gift, we don't make a gift for tax reasons. We don't make a gift just to transact. We're looking for an impact. I know we give in faith, but we are looking for an impact. And more important than that, we're looking for the joy of giving. And integration, how do we connect? If it didn't matter to us, we, wouldn't make, we would make a gift to every single charity that came along, every person that asked us. But we want some kind of connection. You know, I was at Walmart buying the candy this morning, and the, they were selling the Tootsie Rolls, you know. And, I felt obligated. I, it was something that I believed in, so I bought a couple Tootsie Rolls. But I had some joy that I was making a little bit of a difference in the day, and I like to have integration. Well, lively faith, following your path to discipleship. We've been working on hospitality for quite some time. I know at St. John's and Custer we're doing fairly well. It was a slow start, uh, but now we're really we're really coming along, and I don't believe that one one person or one parish can master hospitality in a year or two years. Look at the year we're in of the church now and how long it's taken us to just embrace hospitality. But we're working at it and we can be better and better and better as we do it. Engagement, I will share the slides by the way, just not with the picture of me in the collar. Uh, engagement is really more than just giving it's being involved with your parish, with your diocese. You all probably know what a diocese is, but I guarantee you many of your fellow parishioners don't understand what a diocese is, what it does, or how it fits in the church. And I can remember Bishop Supich saying to me one time, who's your pastor? And I said, oh, that's uh, Father Peter Kavorik. And he said, no, he's not. He said, I am. Gracious giving in action. Hospitality, contemplation, take your time, find out what's important to you. I encourage you to give in faith to your parish, but
but there's no reason you shouldn't understand what your parish does. I didn't even realize that we had a senior meal po program in the basement in Custer. Now that's probably my fault, but when I found out I was very proud to be a parishioner that they were doing that and that our church was paying for that. And that was something that we could get behind. Being connected, impact, involvement, gracious giving, giving that means something to you, following your plan. It's a way of life. It's actually circular. It never stops. Our faith, faith life tends to grow, but our stewardship life is a circle. What can you do action-wise in small steps? First, I would say, pray on this. When you have that quiet time, you will discern what's important for you and your family, and it will help you with your planning. Open your eyes to new avenues. Change your outlook from living in the past to living in the present. And think about how you can make a difference. Every dollar given can make a difference. It's amazing. And you know, when you look at some of these uh, charities from other countries and they say, give $10 and that will change the life. Well, imagine if you did that in your parish, if everyone did, what that would actually do. Maybe attend an extra a daily mass once a month. Become closer to Jesus. I have a hard time sometimes when we when we try to embrace all that we're doing in our stewardship model because some of us move at different speeds. And if you just take small steps, I think this will be easier for some of you. Some of you are rocket ships. You're already disciples and, and you've, you've got it figured out. Some of us need to take smaller steps to get where we need to go. And some of these are those. Join some group in your, in your church to get closer to people, maybe start one. And it doesn't have to be weekly. I'm not in Custer Weekly. I couldn't belong to a weekly group, but I could certainly go to something on a monthly basis or an ad hoc, meaning just getting together basis. That bullet of saying yes, not no, is important. When we say yes, we open up the avenues to connection, integration, and joy. And your gift could be as much your time as your financial resources. But remember, financial resources today are really the time of yesteryear. When they needed to build a barn in this 1800s, all kinds of people would come together, they raise a barn in a day. Their gift was their time. The fuel that runs us today is, is money. And that's how we get to the next level. And you shouldn't be shy, embarrassed about it. I'm never embarrassed to ask someone, would you support this? If I believe in it, I will ask, because I'm not asking for me. And we're not asking in our parish for each other. We're asking for our parish, it's our family. Review your commitments, be intentional, and consider an increase in financial giving. If you sit down and work on your plan, that will become evident. And maybe you are at the place where you need to be, but you will have sat down and looked through it. Planned giving on my side of the spectrum is to have a plan. Don't leave things to chance. If you want to ask me any questions about this after, I'm happy to, to help you. But plan your giving. Go a little bit out of your comfort zone. While I was waiting for this presentation, the previous presentation to end, I was out in the, the lobby there looking at all the gifts from We Walk by Faith, and I worked with everyone on that. I'm humbled by the people that participated in We Walk by Faith. They're all in a book. Every gift that was made is transcribed in a book. But it was a time when our diocese really came together, and you're sitting in a chapel that was already here, but the, the repurposing of this location was a direct result of the generosity of many, many people in We Walk by Faith. Imagine if we harnessed that at the parish level and at the diocesan level. Review all of your philanthropy. The rising tide analogy is simply 
The rising tide raises all ships. If you increase your giving, it's going to encourage others. It's going to encourage you to support all kinds of charities that are important to you, not just your parish, perhaps the diocese, perhaps a national or international appeal. You might look at a percentage. Sometimes you hear that. What, what does that mean? What's a percentage? Maybe that's a starting point for your plan. You just sit down and say, what if we gave 2% more? You decide where that baseline is on from which you take the 2%. But what if we did that? Would it really change us? Would it change our family? I often ask people if they're involved in something like Let's take a step back in history and say we're, we're back and we walk by faith. And I say to Keith, uh, Keith, do you think that, I can't see your name. I'm sorry. You and Cindy could consider giving about 110 or 120 dollars a month for we walk by faith. You don't have to answer, but Keith might say, and Cindy might say, we could consider it. We'll go home and think about it. Do you know when you add that up, that's a $10,000 gift? So if I had asked you for $10,000, you probably would have thrown that paper at me. <laughs> but when you think of it, it, for those of you that do the math, that's after taxes, by the way. It's 167 gross. But even so, that's when you sit down and you say, okay, 2%, 1%, whatever the percentage is, could we consider that? What will that do? What will that do for us, in our heart, in our joy? What will it do for our parish or for our diocese? Automatic giving is easy now, and it, you'll hear bishops say, the first fruits need to go to the Lord. Well, if you do automatic giving, those fruits go first, they go often, and you don't necessarily miss them because they aren't showing up in your home or your account. Anybody here who's 70 plus, you could do IRA transfers to charities without paying tax. Again, I can help you with that, but basically what that means is you have to take distributions. If you'd like them to go to your church, your diocese, or another charity, you can do so without paying tax on them. And estate planning, that's discipleship in action because we really are here for a very short time, but we have a way of making a very significant difference through our estates. And many of us might have fear about running out and those kind of things. This is one way where you can make a difference and still provide for your family. You might consider joining the Terra Sancta Guild. If you are already a member, you might consider increasing, but if you've not joined, we encourage you to do so. Consider joining your parish stewardship team, or being a greeter, or just saying hello to someone, or sitting in the other part of church. That's another thing Bishop always says. Do you always sit in the same seats? I do. <laughs> but now I'm trying. Sandra and I walk in and we deliberately go to the left side, because we're right side people. And we're Saturday people, and we need to go Sunday because someone will say, Custer's a small town, and they'll say, well, do you know so-and-so? And I'll say, oh, they must go Sunday. <laughs> so you really need to get outside your comfort zone. If you've not supported the Diocesan Appeal, consider doing so at a small level. Learn what it does. The Diocesan Appeal is not a poster. It's not an announcement in church. There are people behind that. If you met the people served, you would give generously. It's just difficult to get all the people together so that you could see them. If you increase your charity to all organizations, that rising tide will raise the ships. And you will be joyful. It feels good to give, it really does. When you factor out the commodity of money and you realize that you're giving from your heart, it will feel good and it will feel better when you're able to do as much as you can. I'm going to tell you a little story. How am I doing on time? Wow, I'm going to be on time. 
Um, I want to tell you a story about a gift I made. You remember when I had to go get the two suits and the wingtips? I was a junior consultant and they sent me to Davenport and I had to convince 113 priests to do their own campaigns to raise money for the Newman Center. Well, at the same time, it was my first real professional job. Um, this is the union at Marquette University where I went to school. And I got, a, I got an appeal. I was 25 years old and most 25 year olds like me hadn't planned for anything. I now had a salary, but it wasn't real large. And they asked me for $5,000. It was probably a fifth of my salary, maybe a fourth. And I decided I was going to do that over a five year period. I was going to make that gift. And it was really hard. But I made the gift in honor of my mother and father. And in this union, you see these posts here, that one right there, I went in the union and I looked for my parents' name. I really didn't care about my name. But I remember neither one of my parents went to, went to college. I took them into the union when it was new. And my father, he looked around and he, he just walked up to the plaque. He didn't say a word to me. And he just touched the name. Never said anything. And when I think about the joy of giving, that was one of, the, as a young adult, I realized I didn't miss that money. But I have that connection and that memory. And the building doesn't mean so much to me. But it means a lot to me that I was able to do that. And I, I know that if you sit down and work with your life, and you've probably had these kind of moments, you can create much more joy with gracious giving. So be a disciple. Embrace stewardship. There's no playbook for gracious giving. It starts here, sorry, and it works, works out. It is infectious. If you're enthusiastic and you don't apologize for what you're doing, people will join you. But don't apologize for helping to support your church or your diocese. There's our, our leader, and uh, I'll leave his message there for you to to look at. Um, okay, the last trivia question. This is the end of the presentation. All right, you ready? What country rock band is one of Bishop Bruce's favorites? He doesn't know I'm doing this. <laughs> All right, I'll give you a hint. Nobody's got it yet, huh? <laughs> yeah. Good job. You get more candy. By the way, you're welcome. I've got bags of candy. So if you want a piece of candy, please have at it. Um, that's the conclusion of my presentation. I would ask all of you to take some candy. And we're, um, we're a little early, so if you have some questions, I'm happy to answer them. But of course, Class is over if you'd like to leave and have a, a break. So, any questions? Yes. She's mentioning that you can set up a memorial fund and it brings a lot of solace to a family. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an excellent way of, of being in the present but remembering the past and honoring and memorializing people that you loved in your life. Very important. All my favorites are in there, by the way. Other questions? 
Well, I'm not sure how many will come this afternoon, but please share the message of gracious giving. And uh, thank you for coming. Appreciate it.